I ask you reflection, 1965-1975. The last 10 years have been a time of change and growth for Iowa State University. Tonight we reflect on what has happened and what is in the offing. time period coincides with the years during which W. Robert Parks has been president of the university. Betty Lou Varnum asked Dr. Parks what his goals were when he became president of Iowa State in 1965. Uh, the most important one was the quality of excellence and I've tried my best and I've had a lot of help in this and trying to keep that one goal for us in anything we do because any of these other goals are, are, are really come to nothing unless you maintain quality. Uh, but aside from that, it seemed to me then, and uh, time has, uh, I think, proved that we were right on this, was that this university, although it had been a great university uh, from, or a great college before it was a university, was in fact too narrowly based for the present times. And so uh, an important goal, and one happily, which I think we have pretty much achieved in this decade is to broaden the base of Iowa State University, to uh, fill in and to build up those, um, well, we maybe call them developing areas, those academic areas which had been under-supported in the past. Uh, also the goal of diversity, um, which is akin to that one, and uh, a public service. Uh, this is a tremendously important mission of Iowa State University uh, to take our knowledge out to where people are, where they work and where they live. And we've been doing this ever since the first extension trains pulled out of Ames into the countryside. Uh, happily also, um, I'm going to let you back in the conversation pretty soon, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, Don't get nervous. Don't bother with me. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> uh, uh, happily too, for this, this one um, enunciated goal of public service uh, to improve our service extension function. The new Sheeman Continuing Education Building is beyond all our hopes in helping us now to look at our extension function truly on a world basis. We're going to have the World Food Conference here and so forth. And then just to answer your question on goals, um, when I um, spoke at my inauguration ceremony, which was uh, March 22nd, 1940, uh, 1966, the university's birthday. Um, in my uh, talk there and my concern was uh, what I labeled, uh, again, not in a creative way, but the new humanism. Uh, somehow it seems to me this institution has great opportunity to blend science and humanism. In the way uh, institutions which started out as being primarily literary and liberal arts never have had the opportunity because we have it is easier, I think, to put the humanity together with your sciences than it is to develop the sciences in a later date. But however that might be in terms of sequence, uh, um, I have felt, and a lot of people have agreed with me happily, that uh, this should be a prime uh, continuing goal of us uh, toward a new humanism, a blending of science and humanism, because this is where society's problems can really be solved. Dr. Parks, Surely one of the most impressive signs of growth is the increase in the size of the student body. Statistics. In 1965, enrollment was 14,000. This year, over 21,205 students are attending Iowa State. 82% of the undergraduates are from Iowa. 38% of the students are women. 17% are married. Has the role of the student changed during this period? It's quite clear that in the overall and in broad terms, uh, the role of the student, um, his social environment uh, on campus has changed dramatically in this decade, probably more than any decade in the history of, of this country, or the American university, maybe any university, because if you just look, the, uh, whether we like it or not and whether our students' parents like it or not, the, the whole concept of in loco parentis is pretty well gone. 
Uh, this doesn't mean that students act wildly and irresponsibly, but they have been put on their own responsibility. Um, they, in part, are responsible for this happening, but not entirely, because society has agreed that you're an adult when you're 18, for example. This has happened in the recent years. And so uh, the old rules about hours, imposed hours, um, for men and women students just don't seem to be very applicable anymore, and they are not applied in most places. You're, you're on your own for those decisions. Whether it's right or wrong, the students have much more freedom in making their mind whether they want to um, um, consume alcoholic uh, beverages or not. And um, this is not uncontrolled and unlimited, but that opportunity exists for them today, and they have to be make a responsible uh, decision on their own. Um, They've had an impact also, aside from, the, um, uh, from their social life, which is quite a change, all these options that are available now and they have to handle, than was true a few years ago. Uh, I think students and now, uh, happily so, have, have a, they don't think so, but I think so, you <laughs> see. I have a great deal more to say what their educational experience is going to be like than it was even 10 years ago. Um, if you look back at our curriculum just that short 10 years ago, there are many more rigidities in it. Um, every college, I believe without exception of our six uh, co undergraduate colleges, have moved not only toward more interdisciplinary or interdepartmental, intercollege uh, offerings, but have moved toward making the curricular requirements much more flexible. And the student, again, much fewer, many fewer, I should say, required courses. Uh, I'm not sure this is all that great and these things have a tendency sometimes for a pendulum to swing that way and then maybe swing back i can see some swing back now but the student has had an impact the student right or wrong wanted this very much we hear that other universities other colleges are going to limit enrollments yes uh -huh. if that is suggested to you what would your response be well um if it's just suggested i'd turn it down if it's forced on me, I'd be very sorry about it, because I think it, um, I noticed uh, this article in Chronicle Higher Education, and you can be sure we're going to be faced with this every time we go in for an appropriation for increasing enrollment. Why don't you control enrollment? But I noticed some of those states were very different circumstances in Iowa. For example, the SUNY system, the State University of New York system, is a mammoth system. And uh, the state of New York, it comes as no surprise in a good deal of financial difficulties at the moment. And um, to restrict enrollment there, really in the Northeast, the commitment has almost always been toward private higher education. Public higher education has always been sort of secondary in the, in the Northeast. So I, I sort of write them off as being quite different. At the moment, I do Michigan also as having great financial problems. and, and uh, so forth and so on. When it gets to Illinois, it's a little closer home, but you are talking about Champaign-Urbana, which is a huge um, uh, multiversity compared to the size of this place. Now, uh, having disposed, I hope, of some of those examples, it's not being totally relevant. I think the more basic and fundamental thing is this. Does the state of Iowa or any state feel that it has an obligation to offer higher educational opportunities to the young men and women in the state? Now, if you do, you're going to have to pay for it somewhere. You're going to have to pay for it through um, uh, um, giving more money to your state universities, to your community colleges, uh, through the tuition equalization program to private schools, and I support all of those things. I support education wherever you can find it. But there is no easy way out unless you want to chicken out, or cop out on your responsibility and say we don't have any responsibility for educating these young people. And this is so totally against the whole land-grant tradition which came into being back in 1862 under Abraham Lincoln with a notion of making educational opportunity available to young men and women, regardless of their financial status. It, I think we'd be losing something very precious. When you say, when you have to say in this state, uh, no, you can't go to the school you want to go to, uh, even though you're fully qualified. And the state of Iowa doesn't have to do that either. It, 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 the state's in in too good a shape, and I think it's too committed to higher education to let this happen. Let's talk about money and the university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, how, mm -hmm. Where we get it, what you do with it, and uh, what you hope to do with it, yeah. if you get it. Right. Well, the, um, this is a very timely topic. Uh, 
if we go, and it looks we, as though we have gone to annual appropriation, is always a timely topic because you will be involved in it one way or another year round now. Um, the, I, I think that our uh, politically responsible agencies, that is the executive branch, the governor, and the legislature, have some awfully tough problems uh, to deal with. And I'm not unsympathetic. And there are so many, this is still a very rich country. But there, even so, there are so many good demands and requests for the state dollar and the federal dollar that I, I can understand why um, legislators and governors have tough decisions to make. Um, <clears throat> I, I think in limiting our, our, ourselves to the state of Iowa for the moment, I um, think we're going to have a hard time um, trying to convince the legislature that there are sufficient funds to do all of the things we want and know that we need to do. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not at all discouraged. Uh, as I look at surrounding states, uh, states all over the country, the state of Iowa is in pretty good shape, and I think there are good portents of, 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 of uh, maybe good things to come on our, on our appropriation. Uh, one thing, as far as Iowa State <coughs> is concerned, somebody does like what we're doing, because when you get an enrollment increase of 1,300, 21,000 students, that's a big enrollment increase, although they bring problems. This has got to say, whatever you're doing, uh, students like it uh, compared to whatever else is offered. Um, the, uh, we do have, in this university, I think, excellent support by our alumni and friends. This may be a subject we'll get into later, but this whole tremendous uh, structure of the Iowa State Center, plus a football stadium, actually, in six years without state or federal funding, is really quite a success story, which doesn't belong to me necessarily, but it does belong to our alumni and friends. So, so people there are expressing confidence in us. Um, and what may be more to the point, the legislature is. On several occasions in recent years, it has gone out of its way on its own volition to appropriate money, which we really hadn't asked for, and this is quite a thing, to do particular jobs which they think we can do. For example, the coal research project. Uh, which the legislature appropriated $3 million to Iowa State University to uh, proceed with a study of extraction of coal, washing it, uh, marketing it in an economical way, and we're proceeding that uh, with that. In the field of uh, health, particularly animal health, this uh, is a word I probably can't say, but uh, two years ago, year before last, uh, the legislature became very much concerned with TGE, I can say the initial, <laughs> is transmissible gastroenteritis, and I think I got that Marvelous. right, among baby pigs. And uh, uh, they appropriated a small amount, $70,000 a year to Iowa State Veterinary School to, uh, on a continuing basis to research this thing. This past year, they appropriated, again, a small sum, $50,000 to us to investigate um, um, uh, grain storage, uh, dust combustion, and we're starting on that. Now those you can say are really awfully picky small items in a budget of $80 million a year, and that's about what ours is from state and federal sources. Uh, uh, but it's important. It shows that the legislature doesn't believe you're an ivory tower. They don't believe that this institution is useful. They believe you can help on some of society's most, and the state's most pressing problems. And then finally, as I try to be optimistic, and I can't be every day, but I will be on your program, Bailey. I thank uh, you for that. I uh, think the state's, an, it, the, the potential, the state's economic potential is very good indeed. Iowa's resources are, 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 are pretty stable sort of things. We don't have these fabulous ups and downs that a state like Michigan does, which is so dedicated to the automobile industry. And um, the, the potentials here for Economic, continued economic growth, I think, are very good. And when all said and done, really, your appropriation to the public university is going to depend more on that latter element, whether there is money or not, than on all these other things that uh, I've talked about. Let's talk about the center a little right. bit more in detail and what that has added to the campus, both for the students and for people who come to visit campus. Yeah. Well, of course, this is our most publicized uh, happening at Iowa State, and uh, it's, it's good that it is. We have let people know that we've done something unique, and this is very unique. Um, it, it's, uh, we're just awfully happy that in six years, and that's how long it's taken, the, the um, C.Y. Stevens is the first of those four buildings in the center was opened up in uh, 
fall of 1969. So in six years, all four of those buildings have been completed. Uh, this is not a part of the center, but a uh, football stadium also. And so if you take those together, $19.5 million uh, for the center of the four buildings there, seven and a half million dollars at a minimum what am i up to about 25 million dollars uh, those are my, figures you're, yeah, you're right. used to working with than i am. <laughs> yeah. well i can handle them at about that level without too much trouble and, and this is uh, this is a fantastic story uh, um, for any public university well any university to bring together that kind of contributions in in, in that in that shorter period um, and i think it symbolizes a great deal more than um, than the structures themselves. It symbolizes a, a belief in the university, a, a hope for its future, a desire to be, uh, to be connected with it. It, it, it. I think it says to us, at least I hope it does, we, we think this is an excellent school which needs a little extra edge. You know, and maybe it's a perverse or unfortunate thing about American people, but we don't always give to places that need it. We give to places that we're proud of. For example, you don't give to Harvard University uh, because they need it, you give it to them because you're proud to have your name associated with the enterprise. And I hope this says something of that sort to us. And the combination of facilities is really unique, I think, among American universities, all of them being there together. And I think it's really a handsome aesthetic expression. Indeed, indeed. And with the opening of Scheman, of course, a furthering of the extension of university to others and uh -huh. extension service itself. Right. Could we talk about that continuing role of the university? Oh yes, uh, that's a, a really a <clears throat> not the first love, but one of my real loves is our extension work. Uh, I think it does so much for us and so much for the state. Uh, um, we can get all kind of testimony as to how much it does for people out in the state, uh, uh, but it does a lot for us too. It keeps us in touch with people so that our own programs can be m more meaningful. Well, I think the Scheman building uh, gives us uh, one badly needed and missing piece in our program. That is a facility through which we can do a lot of on-campus um, continuing education work. And it is a handsome facility. Um, it's hard to pick and choose among those buildings there in the center, but if I'd be given a free choice, I would have said that was the most important building to build first. When you're, when you're getting money through contributions, you build it the way the contributions come in. And C.Y. Stevens happened to be really interested, and bless his heart he was, in, uh, in, in theater, in, in performing arts. And so that was first. We could bond by use of student fees and helping build the Hilton Coliseum. So there was a way to finance that. And then, then comes along Bill Fisher, a, a wonderful supporter and a wonderful guy. He likes little theater, intimate theater, and so we got that. And then comes Carl Scheman and many, many other people. These were just the name donors, the big donors, uh, uh, who's willing to uh, talk about continuing education. But in terms of this university's basic, ongoing, solid mission, that building is going to be possibly the most important in the, of the four. Are there other ways that you expect the university to increase taking education off campus. Oh, yeah, campus. yeah. I think this is, I hate to be a, use a trite uh, statement again, but I think this is a real frontier. Maybe it could easily be our most important frontier in the next decade, is um, to involve ourselves more fully and more meaningfully with, oh, you choose your word, adult education, continuing education, extension, open learning is the fashionable phrase of the moment. But somehow, by a whole combination of media and methods, including the one we're using now, television, but by no means limited to it, by newspaper courses, by cassettes, by having learning centers out where our area extension offices are and converting them into learning centers, we've got to be, and we're going to be doing a lot more of taking knowledge out to people in a more formal and more organized way. We're right at the threshold, it seems to me, of beginning to offer programs which lead to off-campus degrees. If we may return from off-campus learning and extension back to the campus and another sign of growth and change. This of course is the new veterinary medicine complex which is being built under construction for several years and now nearing completion. It is located south of the Iowa State University Center, south of the new football stadium, and it is a massive and major undertaking. 
Dr. Parks, how important is this project, this new addition to the university? Uh, during the 10-year period, uh, this, this would have to be uh, uh, the most uh, important academic cluster, uh, just in terms of its dollar value. Uh, uh, this is about a $26 million building project, uh, funding jointly shared by the federal government and the state. We were fortunate to get in on just about the very last of federal money uh, available for building in the health science areas. We barely got in under the wire. A prodigious effort by ourselves and the Iowa congressional delegation in any way you could go to get what we thought was our part of that money. But that's going to be a, a, a tremendously good facility. Um, the, our veterinary medicine program, if, if we aren't one of the world's real leaders, again, I don't know why we shouldn't be, and I'm sure we are going to be with that kind of facility. It's the oldest public veterinary medicine college in, in, the, in the nation. And um, with the National Animal Disease Center, this federal research installation right here in Ames, with all these things going for us, uh, the future has to be really promising in veterinary medicine. This is, of course, the new football stadium used for the first time this fall. We've talked about the center buildings and the new veterinary medicine complex. We have not mentioned the many other buildings and additions to existing buildings that have been part of the construction that has occurred on campus. Buildings designed to house and to further the teaching and research functions of the university. Buildings to house the students. These buildings certainly constitute the most dramatic and visible evidence of expansion during the period we've been discussing. Dr. Parks, let's talk money again. What financial investment is involved? I asked uh, John Pace there in the summer. John Pace, as you know, is the director of our space and schedules here, to just item by item add it up what we'd had here in the way of money for ca major capital improvement over the last decade. And it's an astounding figure, but this isn't very politic for me to talk about it now when we're trying to get the legislature to appropriate more money, but back to that. The astounding figure of better than a hundred million dollars. Uh, this, this is, this of course does include state funding, federal funding, private donations. It includes the center and uh, so forth. But it doesn't include self-liquidating projects such as our residence hall. So I guess, uh, you know, I don't think we have all that many buildings because they come hard and you can see how many more you need. Uh, but I begin to understand when you consider that, uh, that important figure that why your alumni come back or even people who've never been here and are amazed by all the new buildings. Um, but this shouldn't mislead us, though. This, uh, we, we should be grateful and happy, and we are, that we've gotten this much accomplished. But we still have very serious building needs. We're teaching music here on this campus in the kind of buildings that no junior high school student in the state of Iowa is learning, studying music in. We've got a library here. This is, again, I think our, one of our prime success stories, how we've increased the holdings of that library to, to, to give us a, a solid base out of which we can have academic excellence. We've done fine on that in the last 10 years. But building-wise, that place is just way too small anymore. Every time you... Um, at books, you have to take out seats for students, and this is a losing proposition. So we have, an, uh, <clears throat> we do need to modernize, remodel the old veterinary quadrangle for the College of Education, which is scattered here, there, and everywhere. Uh, people have a tough time understanding why we're blowing all this smoke about the new buildings you need if you've had $100 million in the last 10 years. And to use a phrase that I've often used, uh, our problem is we just uh, began too far behind the starting line. We had a great accumulated needs for buildings and this whole growth area took over and then you have to run as fast as you could to stand still and now I think w w with some prospect of, uh, of more gradual growth and we do face that for the future we do have an opportunity now of catching up uh, not for growth but for replacing some of these facilities which really do and must be replaced need to be replaced yeah Let's do talk at this point about what you see and hope for the future. There are some things I see as being important to the future. I've mentioned one, unless I'm badly wrong, uh, we're going to be devoting a pretty sizable effort to open learning, off-campus education, uh, on levels which are not quite of that magnitude. Uh, 
but are important, I think. I think here at Iowa State, we'll be moving um, to perfect uh, a new college here and put it into existence out of pieces that are already here. I think we've come to the point where we need a college of design, uh, and I think our faculty agrees with this, uh, composed of architecture, applied art, and landscape architecture as a beginning, and it'd be a nucleus around which all kinds of, uh, of, of design functions and artistic efforts it can find a happy home. Um, this means moving departments, which are already in other colleges, together. And we do have a handsome beginning here because we have authorized a new fine design center building. And when they're housed together, I think this, this can come about. And it is a kind of an emphasis. First place, those are two of them at least are monopoly fields again. This is the only place that has architecture in the state or landscape architecture, and about the only place that really makes a field out of applied art although some might question that decision. Uh, so I, I feel that to have those creative departments together and to give them the prominence and the encouragement which being a second college would do is something which the state needs and which this university needs, again, to broaden out its image and its, and its actual being is something more than science and technology. So that, that's another development I, I see for the future. I would not want at this juncture to um, specify department by department, but I would fully expect some of our developing departments, which now are offering very fine undergraduate and master's degrees, to, to, to earn their spurs and be offering PhD degrees in the, in the, within the next decade, in areas where we meet the, uh, the criterion, or is there a real public demand that we can meet for this, because we don't need conflicting and duplicating programs. Do we have the staff and the library facilities to do this? I'm not interested in us giving a whole bunch of PhD degrees just for status or prestige, but I am in anything that we do. I think any new area that we in, uh, go into, as for example, more graduate programs, uh, must really have the solid underpinning of excellence, and we've got to be sure that we have that before we even start offering the programs. Last thoughts, President Parks, in looking back over this 10-year period. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. The question is well intended. I, 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 I don't want to state this as a valedictory because I still hope I have some more years around the place. We'll do a this program just, ten this years is just from a, now. This is just a milestone, a ten-year period. Oh uh, yeah, I, um, I think there, are, there are great satisfactions in this in this position. Um, I really get a little weary of some of my colleagues talking about what a tough and trying situation being a university president is. It does have those aspects some days. But we all knew what it was like before we started it, and it's certainly been no worse than I thought it would be, and sometimes better. But there are, are real satisfactions at this university. I know, don't know that much about others. It would differ with the place, because your satisfactions are in large part indigenous to the place you work, I think. And I think a president at Iowa State has, has an awful lot of things he should be thankful for. and. Um, most of those things could be wound up in one big ball by saying it's the people you work with, because we do have a, a faculty, a staff, which in the main are very dedicated people, and they're reasonable people, they're nice people to work with. Uh, uh, they aren't always happy about things and they let you know it, but they're reasonable people to work with. And you have a feeling, I, I don't uh, delude myself as to how important a president is to a university. You don't have a chance of being successful unless you're surrounded by good people. And I don't mean only in your immediate entourage, I mean good people throughout the organization, the kind of people who would do a good job, whoever is president, or whether there is a president or not. And I think we have an awful lot of that here at Iowa State. TV has presented Iowa State University, Reflections 1965-1975.